Hello dear students, welcome to today's class. Today we are going to discuss the tool, technology, art, social organization and many other aspects which were prevalent during the Paleolithic ages. And today's lecture is actually the second part of the earlier lecture on the Paleolithic ages. In the previous lecture, we have already discussed the beginnings of the Paleolithic ages in the world context. Now today, we'll be focusing on these sub-themes. Understanding the Paleolithic tool kit and its technology, studying tool typology of lower, middle and upper Paleolithic times, then to have an understanding of the social organization of the Paleolithic societies and to examine various aspects of aesthetic sense of the Paleolithic people and especially their artistic activities. But first we'll be talking about the Paleolithic tools and their technology. The stone tools found from many archaeological sites constitute an important source to understand the lives of humans in the prehistoric period. That is why it is very important to understand the ways and techniques which were employed by these societies for the fabrication of the tools. Generally speaking, if a pebble stone is broken into many pieces, the largest piece is called the core, while as the smaller ones are known as the flakes. The tool which is made from the core is known as the core tool, while as the tools made from the flakes are known as the flake tools. The process of removing pieces or flakes from a rock, which usually is a core, is known as flaking, and the marks which are casted on the surface of the core tool while flaking are known as the flake scars. Let us now move towards the geographical areas in the world context and try to understand this tool typology and the technology which was involved in the fabrication of these stone tools. Simple stone tools made from pebbles or lava cobbles were discovered at Older Bay and other sites in East and North Africa. Several tools including choppers, scrapers, burinus and hammer stones were fashioned from a single pebble by striking it with a large stone near the pebbles natural edges to remove flakes and then striking the ridges formed near the earlier flakes. According to Mary Leakey and Nicholas Toth, these tools were exceedingly primitive and it is challenging to categorize them into different tool types because they were not made in accordance with any established pattern like later lower Paleolithic tools were. The Homo habilis tool technology is classified as the core technology since the core was transformed into a tool where the flaking procedure mentioned above. However, according to Nicholas Toth's research, these stone tools required careful selection of the raw material for good flaking and a high level of motor skills and coordination of multiple parts of the body, for example eyes, limbs and fingers in order to exercise exact control over the force and direction of the blows to the core stone as well as a certain measure of conceptualization before it could be used. Recent studies have suggested that the Homo habilis species consciously exploited igneous rocks and quartz pebbles as raw materials to build their tools according to their requirements and that they had a thorough awareness of the flaking qualities of the stone. The Homo erectus species also used what we would now call as the core technology, but their tool use was considerably more sophisticated and intricate than that of the earliest lower Paleolithic epoch. The hand axe was the most notable tool that was used throughout this time period. The Homo erectus tool culture has been dubbed as the Acheulean culture by some scholars as a result of the discovery of a huge number of hand axes in addition to some other artifacts at a place which is known as Seyit Acheul 
in northern France. Hand axes from the Acheulean period have also been discovered in a wide variety of forms, ranging from rough forms resembling teardrops to more polished forms with bifacial features. It was crafted by trimming away excess material from a larger core stone with precise hammer blows. Researchers are largely in agreement that the hand axe was a versatile tool that was used for a variety of tasks including, for example, cutting flesh and skinning game, digging out the roots and working on wood, etc. In addition to the hand axes, the Homo erectus species was also capable of fashioning choppers, cleavers and bola stones as well as various minor flake tools such as side scrapers, knives and borers which were used for skinning the animals, working with wood and other activities. Hand axes have not been discovered in substantial numbers in the Southeast Asian continent. In this area, choppers were the most common form of tool which reflects the greater emphasis that humans placed on plant foods in the warmer and more vegetated zones than they did on meat. In East Asia, these kinds of tools were utilized in the processing of bamboo, which is a material that was abundantly available and on its own was capable of being fashioned into more intricate implements like razor sharp knives and spears in addition to serving as a building material and a component in the production of ropes and even containers. When it came to harvesting plant and animal resources, the tools used in the Asian zone such as drills, gravers, points and choppers were just as effective as hand axes which were used in the western zone. Researchers have linked the Middle Paleolithic tool to the Mosterian culture which in turn is thought to have been developed by the Neanderthals. The name originates from the Neanderthal site of Lee Moster Rock Shelter which is located in the southwest of France. This is the location where huge quantities of artifacts linked with this species have been discovered. However, Homo sapiens that appeared before Neanderthals around 2 lakh years ago had already begun to create tools of varied shapes for diverse reasons. These eventually became standardized and part of the tool culture of different Homo sapiens groups. Thus, the Middle Paleolithic technology should not be identified solely with them. The Thaiasian culture was prominent among the pre mosterian cultures and expanded over the Mediterranean, France and even Italy. Tiny tools fashioned by cutting larger stones or pebbles were a defining feature of this time period. The Levallois technique which involved removing multiple flakes from a prepared core was a significant technological advance that the Mosterian tool culture took advantage of in order to produce a variety of miniature tools and even weapons. Therefore, the technology behind the Mosterian tools has been dubbed as the flake tool technology as opposed to the core tool technology which was used by the Oldovian and Oshulian societies to trim the core itself into the shape of a particular tool. The Neanderthals improved upon the current Levallois method by shaping the core before removal, therefore determining the final form of the flake. Because of its resemblance to a tortoise shell, this kind of core is commonly referred to as the tortoise core. Using this method, a single core can be broken into several flakes, blades or triangular points. This technique represents a significant improvement over earlier tool technology due to its complexity 
and the meticulous preparation that was required before the flakes were extracted. Flakes were the primary material for making mosterian and other middle paleolithic tools. Edges were cut off the flakes to make a variety of tools like scrapers, points, knives, tiny saws, etc. Although there were no major changes in the tool technology, between the upper and middle Paleolithic periods, the removal of stone blades and their subsequent reshaping into new tools was an important innovation of the upper Paleolithic humans. The supply of raw materials for tool production also varied. Now wood, bone, ivory, antler, these materials supplemented the stones as popular options for the tool making purpose. The word blade technology has been used to describe the tool technology of this time period. Stone blades were extracted by using a stone, bone, wood or antler hammer to smash a bone or antler on one edge of the formed cylindrical core. Using this method of indirect percussion, a long, flat, narrow and sharp edged flake or blade might be broken off. Then finally, a sharp stick was used to trim the edges of the blade, snapping off the tiny flakes as it was pressed against the edges of the core tool. This technique is known as the pressure flaking technique. Utilizing the raw material more efficiently was a significant benefit of the blade technology or the earlier flake technology. This was especially significant in the environments where basic supplies were presumably more scarce. Last but not the least, the portable blade core technology was a huge time saver for late Ice Age hunter-gatherers who exploited resources across the vast territorial areas. Using this method, Cro-Magnon man fashioned a wide range of high-quality implements and tools including the knives, scrappers, saws, points, borers, and most notably a burin, which is a fine-edged graving tool. Burin was used to create eyed needles, fish hooks, harpoons, the handles of composite tools, and spear throwers, all of which were made from bone, antler, and ivory with sharp edges. The hunting efficiency of upper Paleolithic humans was significantly boosted by their use of a wide variety of bone and antler pointers. Now let us move to another aspect of the Paleolithic ages. We will be now discussing the art and artistic patterns of the old stone ages. Different artistic forms have been passed down to us from hunting and gathering societies. These come from the Middle Paleolithic period in the form of engravings, marks, colouring of bones, minor polishing, holes in bones, etc. We have only a significant amount of evidence from the Upper Paleolithic period, including objects, artifacts, statues, and cave or rock paintings. The majority of artistic representations date from the later Upper Paleolithic age. Rock or cave art is the most complex type of surviving art from the Paleolithic times. This is accessible in the form of cave drawings that have been drawn on the walls, ceilings, or the floors. To depict them, engravings and colors were utilized. The illustrations mostly feature animal figures such as those of mammoths, deer, fish, and birds. Human figures are less frequently drawn. There are numerous drawings of animals that combine various animal elements into a single fictional animal. Hunting scenes with hunters holding their tools are also seen. Some of the best cave specimens of such kind have been discovered from Altamira caverns in Spain. Altamira, which means the high lookout, 
contains a complex cave network. There were paintings of bison, horses, deer, vulvas, and boars on the ceiling. Brown, yellow, red, and black were utilized as the primary colors to represent life. They range in age from 34,000 to 12,000 years. Similar paintings were discovered in the Francis Lascox cave, which are thought to be between 15,000 and 14,000 years old. These figures are more than just animal representations. They seem to be alive and in motion. The animals include bulls, horses, stags, wild goats, bison, cows, and even lions. There are certain geometrical patterns also, and even arrows or spears embedded in dead men and animals. Several similar caves were also found in Asia and Africa. There are several subject and stylistic similarities. Most of the time, these figures are stacked on top of one another with no clear orientation. However, in Altamira and Lascox, they are comparatively in order. In comparison to other animals, fish and birds are rarely depicted in most of these paintings. Human figures are crude, stick-like, and just lines have been used to portray them. The hues appear to have been created using ochre, manganese oxide, and perhaps charcoal as natural mineral pigments. Additionally, some form of binding substance is also applied. Sticks, brush-like devices, or fingers have been used to apply the colors. Decorated bone, horn, and stone implements are another form of art. Some ornament-like artifacts with decorative details have been discovered. These were worn as jewelry on the wrists, feet, or neck. Coloring, drawing lines, engravings, polishing, drilling holes, and molding art items into precise forms are all part of the decoration process. Statues and figurines, meanwhile, are another type of artwork. Vogelherd, a cave site in southern Germany, has yielded some of the earliest known statues. A 6 cm tall horse, a mammoth covered with zigzag patterns, and several engraved ivory bone and horn artifacts were unearthed from this site. This material is roughly 32,000 years old. Two bison statues, each about a meter long, were discovered in a cave in the Pyrenees. It is believed that these date back somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000 years. The oldest firmly dated artistic example is found in Morocco and Israel. Snail shells pierced and covered with red ochre and shell beads etched with simple geometric patterns were found there. The pattern suggests that these might have been beads. Along with these, the archaeological discoveries in France, Spain, Germany, etc. include around 230 caves with paintings, drawings, and sculptures depicting representational art, image making, prehistoric paintings, etc. There are the evocative rendering of animals and some humans at many sites that employ a complex mix of naturalism and abstraction. The art of those people helps us to a large extent in understanding them. They also produce jewelry and rock art, enabling them to engage and perform religious duties such as rituals and burials. Art historians put forward different perceptions and theories regarding the nature of the paintings of the Paleolithic period and the intent of the makers of these paintings. Some believe that it represents the magic or rituals of hunting, while others believe that these paintings are the representation of social gatherings 
which occurred on the occasions of coming together during festivities. Anyway, these artistic activities are very significant and serve a storehouse of information to us. Now let us talk about the communication patterns which were probably prevalent during the old stone ages. Both Homo habilis and Homo erectus species lacked the thoracic anatomy necessary for speech. Hence it is generally agreed that they could not have spoken with one another verbally as we do it today. The structure of the Neanderthal thorax suggests that they could form simple words, but it is unclear whether or not they could form complete sentences or communicate in any meaningful way through speech. It is possible that they communicated through the use of signs, notations and even a small vocabulary of noises. As they are similar to modern humans, it is assumed thus that Homo sapiens, sapiens from the Upper Paleolithic could also use language. It is safe to claim that progress was made in the field of communication throughout this time period and the usage of the similars can be seen as forerunners of the script which emerged in later epochs, but speech was still utilized for communication within the group and with other tribes. Let us now move to another aspect which is the social organization and habitation which was prevalent in the old stone ages. Living arrangements, housing, food sources, death rites and religious tenets of the hunting and gathering societies are poorly documented in the modern studies. Most of the organic materials have decayed but the inorganic ones have endured. Nonetheless, clues regarding their dwelling, means of subsistence and social organization can be gleaned from the scattered pieces, tools, artifacts, locations of finds and even conditions under which they were preserved. Little is known about the homes or size of Homo habilis tribes during the lower Paleolithic period. Plants made up the bulk of their diet with the remainder coming from raw meat which was scavenged probably from the deceased animals or hunted from extremely small creatures. We can trace the use of fire, the construction of homes, the organization of society into bands of 25 to 30 individuals and the practice of organizer hunting back to the Homo erectus era. As a result of all these factors, they were able to maintain a certain way of life. Their shelters include natural caves and oval or circular man-made homes. These were set up from tree branches and covered with animal skins. The use of fire in homes can be inferred from the presence of the hearths. It was customary to roast meat or open flames or in pits before eating it. Men did the majority of the hunting while women did most of the harvesting of plant food and foraging. Different communities of humans existed but occasionally regrouped yearly or semi-annually. It was within a relatively small area that groups were able to move. Large animals, particularly herbivores, were likely hunted throughout the time of Neanderthalenses and even Homo sapiens as evidenced by hunting techniques, types of hunt, food consumption, tool types and the bones found at some of the habitation sites. There is physical evidence that humans hunted enormous mammals including the bison, mammoths, horses, wild boar, reindeer and other deer and livestock. Because reindeer were the most sought after game in Europe, almost 90% of the skeletal remains unearthed thus far come from this species alone. Hunting large animals must have been made easier with the help of spears and hunting huge game 
was a social event, perhaps limited to the males only. The animals taken in the hunt were meant to be shared among the whole band. Aquatic organisms like fish and frogs have been added to the list of acceptable animal fare. Over 26,000 salmon fish bones were discovered in the Kudaro caverns in the Great Caucasus. The majority of the 15,000 bones found at Oxy Kichik in Kazakhstan are those of the steppe turtle. Fish were more common in the Upper Paleolithic because of the greater accessibility of hunting and fishing equipment. Between the 14,000 and 10,000 BP, fish consumption was exceptionally high throughout Europe. The range of plant foods appears to have grown as well and root extracting implements varied and plant-based food storage was clearly practiced. Dietary plant intake was typically determined by what was growing in close proximity. However, basic requirements were met through foraging and using the resources already there in nature with no harm done to the environment. Caves and sites used by the Neanderthals show that these areas were inhabited by several distant tribes over time. Important cave locations include the Shanidar Caves in Iraq, the Teshuk Tash Cave in Mongolia, and the Hortus Caves in southern France, and even the Kilina Caves in Moravia, which are located in Uzbekistan. The discovery of artifacts, bones, etc. in caves is more significant. It appears that people sought to make their homes near bodies of water, such as rivers and forts, and also in the areas with an abundance of food sources, such as wetlands. Huts are built to a high standard, with lines delineating each room. The majority of the furniture had wooden frames covered in skins. It also appears that bones, stones, and even mud were also used. So with this, we have come to the end of the today's lecture. I hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you so much.